Hello and welcome to Press TV's News Analysis. Coming to you from Tehran, I'm Marzia Hashimi. Thanks so much for being with us. Well, Islamic awakening, that's what the movements and revolutions in the Middle East and North Africa has been called by the leader of the Islamic revolution, Ayatollah Khamenei. And today he addressed many people who were in attendance at the first Islamic awakening conference that has been held in Tehran and we'll be talking to some of the guests. سخن از یک واقعیت خارجی مشهود و محسوس است که فضا را انباشته و قیام ها و انقلاب های بزرگی پدید آورده و مهره های خطرناکی از جبهه دشمن را ساقط کرده و از صحنه بیرون رانده است The leader of Iran's Islamic Revolution was addressing the first international conference on Islamic awakening in Tehran Scholars from 80 countries are in attendance Ayatollah Khamenei described the revolutions in the Middle East and North Africa as popular movements seeking the revival of regional nations and national dignity, which was denied by U.S.-backed dictators for decades. He said such movements are deeply rooted in Islamic values and are against the influence of the U.S., the West, and Zionism. <laughs> در برابر نفوذ و سلطه آمریکا و اروپا که در طول دو قرن بیشترین لطمه و خسارت و تحقیر را بر مردم این کشورها وارد آوردند. آیت الله خامنه ای also said the revolutionary nations are after Islamic democracy which has nothing to do with the western style laic and liberal system. He also said recent revolutions in the Middle East and North Africa have been inspired by Iran's Islamic revolution that toppled the U.S.-backed Shah in 1979. Meanwhile, the leader of Iran's Islamic revolution cautioned revolutionary nations against the dangers that threaten their popular movements. He called on Muslim nations not to get conceited, and to stand united in the face of the hegemonic power's plot. He said the U.S. and its allies would do everything from causing divisions to staging ethnic and regional wars to defeat these revolutions. Ayatollah Khamenei also advised the revolutionary nations to maintain revolution principles, including independence, freedom, justice and unity, and never let Western countries interfere in their internal affairs. He also said... Muslims must avoid ethnic divisions and extremism and called on revolutionary nations to remain united and to not trust the U.S., NATO and their European allies. هرگز به آمریکا و ناتو و به رژیم های جنایتکاری چون انگلیس و فرانسه و ایتالیا که زمانی دراز سرزمین شما را میان خود تقسیم و غارت کردند اعتماد نکنید. Ayatollah Khamenei called for the liberation of Palestine from the Israeli occupation and said the ultimate goal of Islamic awakening should be the establishment of a united Islamic Ummah. Well, I'd like to welcome uh, my guest uh, to the program uh, from uh, Washington, D.C., Mr. Muhammad Al-Asi, who's the uh, Imam of uh, Masjid Al-Islam. I'm sorry, Mas uh, the Islamic Center of Washington, getting you guys confused, and, of course, uh, Imam Abdul Ali Musa from Masjid Al Islam, also okay. in Washington D.C. Thank you both for being with us. Um, three words that come to my mind when I think about the speech that uh, Ayatollah Khamenei gave on Saturday to the Islamic Awakening Conference: vigilance, patience, and unity were the words uh, that he stressed in order, as he called it, for these movements, these revolution, to be victorious and stay on track. Uh, your take on it? Yes, uh, the, um, the awakening that is occurring throughout different countries in what is called the Middle East, I prefer the, the word the Islamic East, but um, that's the media. What is happening in those countries um, is really momentous. And <clears throat> I think 
if you listened very closely to the leader's uh, statement, uh, you could uh, glean from his um, sentences that he wanted to impart to the listeners and uh, to the viewers the fact that uh, this awakening needs a direction. Because uh, as we have seen in the past several months, uh, there's a quite a, um, an intensive emotionalism uh, that is displayed by the masses in such places as Cairo, in Sana'a, in uh, Tunis, uh, in Bahrain, and in other uh, countries. Uh, what is needed in, in the midst of all of this is an anchor. And uh, <clears throat> what I read from his um, statement is that uh, there has to be a, um, a leadership uh, that gives direction, direction to uh, this movement. Uh, otherwise, and this was probably left out of, of the discourse, but uh, putting the pieces of the puzzle together, otherwise the forces of imperialism and even Zionism will hijack uh, these uprisings. Uh, and they do have the finances, they have their, um, uh, some of them are agents, and some of them are just um, the, the typical liberal westernized uh, intelligentsia that want the future in these countries to be a future that is compliant with um, what you may call the status quo or the American, European, uh, Israeli uh, uh, grand uh, alliance in the area. They don't want these countries uh, to quote unquote break loose from uh, American hegemony. This, this, the same that happened in the Islamic Republic of Iran. In other words, they don't want to see another Islamic Republic in Egypt or in Yemen or in these other countries that is independent of their uh, influences and their diktats. They want, uh, in the best case scenario, they want to, this, to, they meaning the imperialists and the Zionists, they want to satisfy the emotionalism of the people saying, okay, if you want an Islamic type of setup, uh, we have no problems with you applying your Islamic laws. You can cut off the heads of certain people who commit certain crimes, or you can cut off the hands of certain people who commit certain other crimes. You can have your own penal system. But when it comes to, uh, let's say, the economy of, the, of, the, of these countries, or when it comes to the liberation of Palestine, uh, from Israeli occupation, you have no say in that. We are the ones who are going to tell you what your foreign policies are going to be, what your financial policies are going to be, what your economic policies are going to be, and you're going to listen to us. Okay. Well, now, uh, Imam Musa, are we seeing a change this time around? We know that in the past uh, there has been infiltration and control in these Muslim countries. We have seen several things, especially recently, as far as the Egyptian, the people taking back, uh, going back out to Tahrir Square and demanding uh, actually the Israelis, the Israeli embassy to be closed, demanding that the, um, the way to Gaza be open. And also now we're seeing it in Jordan. We seem to see be seeing a, a total different chain of events that's taking place. Has there been a totally different perspective or change that has taken place amongst the uh, Muslim Ummah? Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Yes, you could see that there's a, a, a change and an expansion. It, it's probably something similar to this, that uh, the revolution was uh, itself was an evolutionary process. This process that we're going through right now will probably go through several phases. Probably the first phase would be like now, when the people are waking up and rising up. Automatically, the forces of evil would come out, the U.S., the Israelis, and try to block the process, like they did in Egypt. They'll try to shortstop it or derail it. That's automatic. Okay, but that won't stop the people. The next phase would be something similar to what we're noticing very small kernels of, is not a national 
uh, idea developing, but a regional vision, you know, not a Yemeni vision, not an Egyptian vision, but a regional. When we say Middle Eastern, we mean that the people will begin to see themselves as a region. That means the part, the people who are taking part in the change. That's happening already because in Jordan, the Israeli embassy is having trouble. In Egypt, is having nobody called anybody to tell them to do that. They 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 got the feeling all in their own. See, these Western powers can interfere with us, and they can even initiate some things. But once they get rolling, other environmental circumstances, unforeseen events enter the picture, and then it takes on its own life. So we see this movement going through, getting ready to go through the second phase, that is developing a regional picture. And from that regional picture comes, okay, now we have a picture of what we want to look like. Now what do we have to do? That's when mutual cross-border, cross-Madhab cooperation began to take place, and then we're headed to whatever this new world, uh, new Middle Eastern world is going to look like, but it will be determined by the people themselves. And definitely Islam will play a serious part. But you see, if you notice the Islamic movements right now in Egypt and other places, they're sitting back a little bit and let things develop because they know these are things that are happening that they're not initiating. If they're not initiating, that means some other governmental or ultra extra organizational pressure is being put. So it seems like that they're waiting for the proper time to exert their energy. Because the last point is this, whatever happens, Islam wins no matter what happens. Why? Because the dictatorships are being weakened. When the dictatorships are being weakened, the only groups that really had some cooperation, some coordination, and decades of activity is the Islamic movement. So this looks like some of the factors that are taking place. Now, let right me ask now. you about uh, as far as leadership in all of this. You said that it's different phases and we're in another phase at this point in time. How important or is it important in your perspective leadership of this, these revolutions? Well, leadership at this point has uh, two factors. One is good and the one is negative. If you have leadership that you can point out, you can eliminate them right away. If you can't put your hands on the leadership, then you have to fish around to find out where to put the blocks. So it has two points. A leadership will naturally evolve. The kind of leadership that takes will take this movement to where it should be. People will step up to the plate and they will interject at this time. It, it's more like, not like a revolution, it's an evolutionary process. We believe Iran was the last revolution, and revolutions are a thing of the 20th century. This is the 21st century. Uh, people are evolving, and not only in the Muslim world, but the whole world is developing a kind of collective mentality saying that we can do better than this. We don't have to live in this type of a world. And this is uh, all kind of green people, all kind of environmentalists, all kind of humanitarians, they're saying we have to develop a new world. In, in our area, the hindrance to these new worlds are dictators. In other areas, it's economics and different factors. So in each part of the world, you can see in Europe, people are going in the street. They're saying enough is enough. So it's all interrelated in it's some way. It's all interrelated. So. It reminds us of the period of decolonization uh, in the world and civil rights in the U.S. Nobody called each other to say let's go, but the whole world seemed to develop a collective mentality around the same time. Okay. Yeah. Oh, let me uh, get uh, Imam Asi back in on this now. With the uh, in the speech that uh, Ayatollah Khamenei made, he kept referring to um, the people making sure that their revolutions would not be hijacked, and uh, that there are certain powers that be 
that are trying to get involved and sidetrack their revolutions. Your perspective, what needs to be done in order for these revolutions not to be hijacked? Well, to, to give this a little context, to give his statement a little context, uh, not all of the, let me, let me put it this way, not all of these revolts were created equal. Uh, in my reading of it, uh, of course, we have some Muslims who have a conspiratorial mindset. If something happens somewhere, and this, this reminds me of the Islamic Revolution in Iran. At the beginning of the Islamic Revolution, even members of the Islamic movement in the world uh, were suspicious that the Islamic Revolution in Iran was being macro-managed by Britain and the United States, and uh, these are red mullahs and you know all of this type of stuff. And then when it hit them hard, they realized, well, this is, no, 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 we had it all misunderstood. Uh, so this same type of mentality is at work right now. They perceive the movement of the people over there in some uh, countries, uh, especially Tunisia and Egypt, because these are, in my uh, assessment of uh, these people's movement, uh, <coughs> Egypt and Tunisia represented... Uh, an authentic outburst of the sentiments and the pent-up feelings of the masses there who have been suffering from um, uh, all sorts of internal uh, policies, domestic uh, politics that were smothering their lives, uh, almost physically suffocating them economically. So they burst out like this, uh, spontaneously. They took, in my opinion, they took two, um, uh, two uh, segments uh, by surprise. The first one w were the uh, foreigners, uh, such as the European powers and the United States and the Israelis, with all the informants they have, the spies, the, uh, the presence in these countries. I don't think they saw this coming in these two countries, remember. Uh, <clears throat> the other uh, segment that they took by surprise, believe it or not, are the, <clears throat> the Islamic movement. The Islamic movement did not e e uh, expect this type of massive development to erupt in such a, a, a quick uh, paced manner. Uh, and uh, both of these right now were caught up in trying to make uh, uh, <coughs> the, uh, the Americans in particular, uh, the American government officials, as well as Euro some European uh, governments such as France and, and, and Britain and others, what they were doing right now, they were trying to uh, handle these uh, revolts as damage control. How this is this is damage. How are we going to control this damage? They went into that mode to deal with it. On the other hand, the the Islamic movement members who come from different factions and organizations, they were delighted that this happened. It took them by surprise. So now they were trying. They are. They still are trying to figure out how to give this direction. So so let me stop you right there. So you say on the one hand, the Americans, the British, the French uh, were caught by surprise, and also the the Islamic movements. Now yes. months into this. Who's figuring out exactly what to do better? At this point in time, do you see the influence as far as the Westerners? Um, can you see it more than, for example, six months ago? Or the Islamic movements, are they developing? How do you see it? Well, they're playing chess. Both sides are playing chess. And uh, I think the Islamic movement is trying now to make up for lost time. They're trying in their own way to fill in the vacuum, um, and as I said, we, I didn't finish what I was trying to say. I began with saying that Tunisia and Egypt, these were the, the, the two areas that uh, sent shockwaves down the spinal cord of imperialism and Zionism. Uh, but the other countries, I'll take two examples just to skip over the other details because, you know, you see, there are revolutions right now in the making. They are uh, beneath the surface. They haven't uh, exploded above the surface. These places are such places as Morocco, uh, the 
the Arabian Peninsula with the exception of Yemen and Bahrain, these are all right now under the surface movements that may in the coming months or years explode the same way we see what is happening in Egypt and Tunisia and Yemen and these other places. And then there are pre-existing types. What was happening in Yemen preceded what, what, is, what happened in Egypt and in Tunisia. Jordan has been a simmering uh, case of a popular resentment and movement against the monarchy there. So, you, But the way the, the uh, American uh, imperialist policies, along with its Zionist sidekick, the way they operated was to address Egypt and Tunisia via Libya and Syria. This was the way that they are trying to uh, take care of uh, what I refer to as damage control. Brother, I'm out of time. 30 seconds. Uh, how do you see this all playing out? What does it take, in your words, for these revolutions to be successful? 30 seconds. What it's going to take is the uh, Islamic... Uh, the, the members of the Islamic movement who belong to different organizations and different orientations, they have to get together, work out a common arrangement. What's our common denominator here? Set aside the differences that we have, work on anchoring in an Islamic direction, orientation and leadership for these popular movements. Come out in public and say, we are going to make these independent decisions that have been waiting for such a long time. Okay. And on that note, so sorry, but I thank you so much, Imam Muhammad al Asi, Imam Musa, Abdul Ali Musa. Thank you both for being with us. Thank you very and as much. always, viewers, we appreciate uh, you being with us on another close-up look at one of today's uh, top stories. Join us here, same time, same place, tomorrow for one of tomorrow's top headline stories. Well, I'm Marzia Hashimi, signing out for myself and all the crew right here in Tehran. Thank you so much. And goodbye.